And one other area in which, uh, which is actually very topical at the moment, because not least because there was a page of uh, an article about this in the Wall Street Journal today, but also was the subject of the state visit of Hu Jintao here a few couple of weeks ago, um, is about actually ways in which a lot of emerging markets substitute things for real innovation. So many of them have a network of um, uh, protective discriminatory policies aimed at procurement by governments for products and uh, processes, information security, intellectual property rights protection, <coughs> fiscal incentives. These things are designed to protect local companies or confer favors to local companies at the expense of uh, foreign companies. This is a particular case, as I'm sure you, many of you are aware, uh, with regards to American companies who I think in many respects care more about these things than they even do about the value of the Chinese currency. So at the end of last year, for example, the 21st session of the US-China Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade um, did sort of conclude with a bit of a fanfare uh, because there was an agreement in which China agreed to stronger enforcement of intellectual property rights, uh, purchases of legal software, and some softening in what they've called their indigenous innovation program uh, and gave US companies better market access to uh, one of, in one or two areas. But it's sometimes very difficult to disentangle real progress in these issues from the kind of window dressing and tweaking that often characterize sovereign relations. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical uh, that China, uh, and the US for that matter, are making enough progress on the issues of mutual interest um, to offset the lack of progress in addressing issues that divide them, including those related to corporate governance. Um, as I've just described. So for the moment, uh, the tone of US-China relations, uh, witnessed the recent visit, of course, you know, it does seem to be a bit better than it has been in the tail end of last year. Um, it does help, of course, that growth everywhere is picking up. Certainly things in the United States seem to be much better than they appeared likely a few months ago, for as long as it lasts, I would say. Um, and certainly it's true that in China and the emerging world, output is just roaring ahead at breakneck speed. I mean, compared with the crisis, the pre-crisis pre peak in output, uh, China's production is now about 20% higher than it was then, mm -hmm. um, which is just a, a startling performance and just kind of underscores really why China was in a very favorable position when the crisis actually happened. However, there are two reasons why I think uh, dangerous to be complacent. Uh, the first is rising inflation not just in China, but in many emerging countries, in contrast to what's going on in our world. And second, the need for economic reform, which I explored uh, right at the beginning, which I'll say a few words about in a minute. So I think what's going on in the world now is we're kind of, we're bifurcating, you know. So the rich countries are facing this way with one set of economic problems and one set of economic needs. The emerging countries are facing this way with something that's completely different. Uh, and actually, um, this is particularly the case in China, uh, where a credit boom, property market inflation, uh, very low interest rates, and a repressed exchange rate all bear many resemblances to Japan in the early 1980s. The issue, I think, is very clear. China is nursing uh, a structural increase in its tendency towards higher inflation. The outcome, however, is completely unclear, uh, and it's pure conjecture. On, on my part and everybody else's, whether the People's Bank of China, which is a subsidiary uh, agency to the state council, so it doesn't have any independence really at all, whether the People's Bank of China will be given the mandate by politicians to put inflation genie back in the bottle quickly and decisively, or whether the task will be kicked, or the can will be kicked down the road, so to speak, and deferred until after the leadership changeover in 2012. China's not the only country experiencing this problem. And Brazilians, Indonesians, Turks, lots of emerging countries face this problem, but it's particularly sensitive in China. Last year, uh, for those of you certainly that follow this, interest rates were raised twice at the end of 2010. Uh, reserve requirements uh, for Chinese banks were raised seven times. And at various points during the year, the Chinese introduced measures to try to dampen down property market inflation. They increased you know, deposit requirements for buying a house. Uh, they just introduced uh, pilot schemes to tax property in Shanghai and Chongqing uh, and uh, introduced various measures to try to control food prices. But the problem, I think, is much bigger than they think it is. They say it's all about food prices, but as I said before, it's about much more. The stock of credit in China, 
Uh, I mean, we've just been through a credit crisis, and we're not going to have a credit expansion, certainly not in the United States or in Europe, for a very long time to come, not a meaningful one. But it's rampant in China and some other emerging countries. Uh, in fact, the money supply in China, uh, the M2 version to be uh, specific, is bigger in that country than it is in the United States, despite the fact that the American economy is three times bigger than China's. Um, to be fair, uh, you know, China's capital markets are much, much less developed than yours are, uh, inevitably. But that just underscores my point, that if you have a relatively poor, inflexible economy that's got a lot of money and bank credit sloshing around inside it, it just underscores that there is an inflationary potential which might be absent otherwise. Plus, wages are racing ahead in China for the fourth year. They're running at about 20% per annum uh, for two reasons. The first is <clears throat> the government actually wants wages to rise more quickly because it's part of the way in which they want to try to rebalance towards a more consumer-friendly society. If you don't give people income, they won't spend enough. But the other reason is a demographic uh, reason, which is pushing wages up from below. And this is really about the unintended consequences of the one-child policy. So as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, China has extreme gender imbalance. The average is about 120 men for 100 women. But at second and third births, the gender imbalance ratio is about 160 to 180 men to 100 women. Uh, so apart from the rather uh, unsavory social consequences to which this is giving rise, uh, which I'm not going to talk about tonight, um, not, be not before dinner anyway, um, uh, it, it has it's got very serious economic implications because for the last two or three years now, actually China's beginning to run out of, not run out of labor, because it still has a lot of migrants who want to come to the cities, but it's running out of cheap, female, skilled labor. And typically, the women tend to go from the farms to the factories, and the men go from the countryside to the construction sites. I mean, I'm exaggerating for the sake of effect, but that's essentially what happens. And of course, if there's a shortage of women, shortage of skilled women labor, and since women tend to go back to the farms and the factory of families when they're between the ages of 28 to 32, uh, to look after parents, grandparents, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's quite clear that, you know, that China is beginning to run into constraints, labor constraints, in this particular cohort. It's very, very important to the whole uh, structure and cycle of production. Um, so what you've got in China is uh, rampant credit inflation, rising food prices, uh, rapidly rising wages, which are now going to continue to rise uh, very quickly for the foreseeable future, um, and a central bank that probably doesn't have the mandate to put this genie back in the bottle, as I said. So the challenge they have is no different from the challenge that we have in the Western world either, which is how to get the balance right between lowering inflation and making sure that you don't sacrifice too much in terms of economic expansion. We all have this issue, but it happens to be a particularly sensitive issue in China for all the obvious reasons to do with political stability and the informal social contract in that country which says we the people will be peaceful and obedient provided you give us 9%, 10% GDP growth year in, year out. And what I'm trying to suggest is you can't guarantee that that's going to be the case uh, for very long. So if they had a more radical approach to the management of interest rates and exchange rates, for example, uh, it would be very timely. Uh, but the economic and political consequences of doing so I think make it very naive to think that there will be a big policy shift anytime soon. And even if there were, I suspect that they would probably back away at the first sign of weakening growth. No one wants to preside over a dampening down of the property market and by implication a threat to China's middle class uh, before the leadership change takes place next year, possibly not even after. So apart from inflation, uh, the other reason why the status quo won't last is the complex relationship between China the creditor and America the debtor, um, which have a relationship in economic terms which seems irresolvable at the moment. I'm not saying it can't be resolved, it's just I don't think that dialogue is taking place really. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and the issue really is a very simple one is, you know, as I said right at the beginning, if we save more, you know, somebody else has to save less. And if China can't save less, and it does save 53% of its national income, um, then we will sink into uh, a rather unfortunate economic morass surrounded by uh, quite a lot of uh, rather 
disturbing developments, which we see some signs of in the form of protectionism and uh, trade restraint and currency wars and all these other things that people worry about. So the big issue, and I think it's important that lawmakers, not just in this country but elsewhere as well, it's important that lawmakers don't get obsessed with the Chinese exchange rate. I mean, it's in real inflation terms, it's rising anyway. So to some degree, the trade imbalance is being already ad addressed through Chinese inflation, which is four times as high as it is here. Um, but the real issue is actually why China saves so much and how does it bring its savings rate down more radically so that this transition to the next consumer-related society can take place. There are many things China can't do anything about. It can't do anything about the fact that the dependency ratio of children and older people on the working age population is now at its trough, and that's typically associated with periods of high savings. That's a kind of a demographic issue which is not possible to change. Uh, but there are lots of things that they can change to do with wages, uh, rural income, social security, uh, allowing companies to pay dividends to households, uh, macroeconomic policies and so on. And the Chinese certainly recognize some, but not all of this, in the drafting of their new uh, 12th five-year plan, uh, which will be approved and, and rubber stamped uh, next April. Um, so um, I think the, the issue uh, you know, should be framed more in terms of really how is China progressing in terms of bringing down its very, very high savings rate, which is what causes the trade imbalance in the first place, uh, rather than on very specific measures about whether the RMB should be valued at 660 or 640 or 620. Actually, in the scheme of things, that doesn't really matter. The trouble with rebalancing is that it's not just a question of ticking off boxes and say, well, we'll do this, and then we'll do this, and then we'll do this, because uh, that's what we do in our kind of spreadsheet-obsessed world, we basically say this is how the changes will take place and by 2015, 2020, 2030, this is what it's going to look like. The trouble is change is something that has to be made to happen, it just doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, and as the American economist Magra Olson highlighted in a book about 20 years ago, perhaps more actually, 25 years ago, uh, long periods of economic expansion lead to the entrenchment of vested interests, okay? If you want to put it more colloquially, money is power. So if you have long periods of economic expansion where certain classes of people make a lot of money, they have a lot of power that goes with it, and it's very difficult to take that power away. We know that's true in our world because we're trying to do this with the financial services and the housing industry. Um, it's complicated, it's very, very fractious. Um, but China has the same problem. Um, and as I said, you know, the power rests in the cities, in the coastal regions, and in the company sector. And that power has to be shifted elsewhere. Um, or else uh, the change won't really happen, or it'll only happen in very half-hearted fashion. Um, so I think it's very important that we pay you know, a lot of attention. Well, I certainly, in, in the economics world, we pay a lot of attention to actually how these changes, and if these changes are, can take place, and if they can happen without political turbulence and social instability. Something worth watching, actually, because the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences logs about 90,000 incidents of social unrest each year in each of the last four years. Most of these are quite innocuous, and probably not worth even reporting. Many of them actually are quite violent and uh, aren't organized by political parties or labor unions as they would be in other countries, but actually are spontaneous, what, he, what a sociologist calls spontaneous venting incidents. It's just people just getting mad at corruption at uh, miscarriages of justice and uh, local uh, officials basically abusing uh, political rights. So uh, the idea that citizens might rise up uh, to turn uprising on its head, that they might rise up against corruption and injustice, deprivation of rights, is not so fanciful, particularly if at some point in the next few years the growth rate in China should stall. Some people think that the Chinese Communist Party obviously has become extremely pragmatic. They've ditched Marxism, established the most successful state capitalism that probably the world's ever seen, uh, and that they're perfectly adept at being able to manage this process through political reform. We'll see. Wen Jubao started a program last year to try to campaign for wider political debate about reform and was promptly shut up um, during the course of last year. Um, and um, uh, just left me personally rather kind of um, wondering actually whether this campaign actually will ever get off the ground as things stand. Anyway, interesting times ahead, no doubt, fully in keeping with
the infamous Confucian curse. But what I'm trying to say is kind of the bottom line here is <coughs> the future isn't a straight line. It's not been predetermined. China probably will become a much richer country over the next 10 or 20 years, but it's not going to be a smooth or turbulent free path. I'd like to finish uh, by making, if I may, if you'll permit me, uh, some observations uh, from across the pond, so to speak, about uh, my host country here today, because this is kind of part of the great debate as well. Uh, so some final words then about uh, the US. I don't think there's any question that America's relative weight in the global system, uh, economically and politically, is declining, relatively speaking, to a rising China, uh, and the West's is to emerging countries in general. Whether this means that the United States is in irreversible decline, bringing it with it possibly social trouble, uh, is more debatable. Um, I'm sure you know these people better than I do, but the journalist and commentator Thomas Friedman has taken one side of this argument, and the political strategist and author George Friedman, his namesake on the other side, has taken the other side. Um, so you can debate this ad nauseam, I'm sure, uh, and they do. I'd say, uh, for the foreseeable future, there are at least a half a dozen positive attributes which will keep the United States as the preeminent or the prominent power in the world, if not as dominant as it used to be. First of all, you have undoubted, uh, when I say you, I'm not talking about you, I mean, your country has undoubted military supremacy and a favorable geography in the form of two oceans, largely friendly neighbors, a northern neighbor that's got a lot of oil, water, gas, um, and a southern neighbor that seems to be quite friendly as well, um, largely. Um, second factor, um, okay, you probably, I don't want to get into too hot, hot territory here. Uh, the second factor is uh, America has a lot of resources in a world that's going to be very tight and very competitively uh, uh, scrambling for resources, particularly in terms of metals, oil, and nat natural gas, uh, not to mention that as one of the major uh, strengths. You have technological and innovative strengths. Um, if you look kind of beyond the main things that we look about, you know, about aircraft and computers and what have you, in genetics, molecular and supercomputers, synthetic self-producing organisms, nanotechnology, robotics, American companies are amongst the leaders in the field, and this is kind of where the future will be. Demography, um, uh, I'm not going to even get into the word healthcare. Uh, it is the big problem uh, that the United States faces as you get older. Uh, in Europe, it's pensions. Here, it's more likely to be health, or it is healthcare. But by 2050, China will be older than the United States on every single metric that matters. Uh, and the dependency ratio, the burden, so to speak, I don't mean this in a pejorative sense about grandma and grandpa, but you know, the dependency of old age peop older pe citizens on wor working age people will be much higher in China than it is here. Um, higher education, I've already mentioned that. Um, US dominates the top 500. Um, and as I've emphasized before, in legal and social institutions, sophisticated capital markets, number one. Um, I'm sure you know probably better than I do the four horsemen of, the, of disorder, I would say, if not horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, obviously, there's a risk during these hard-pressed times of public expenditure and taxes and what have you, that if you strangle your universities uh, of financial funding, strangle research and development budgets, um, you could add to the problem that's already building in secondary schools and primary schools where, according to an OECD report, the United States ranks 25th in maths and 17th in science. Not good. Obviously, higher education is a different kettle of fish altogether, but you've got to start them, you know, when they're young, as you know. Uh, secondly, uh, I've already mentioned the loss of technological advantage in some areas like uh, clean air and high car low carbon technologies. Uh, the third area is what are you going to do uh, for an encore now that housing and financial services have gone into the can? Where are the new industries? Who are the companies that are basically going to fit into the new global order and create and exploit the comparative advantages that um, the United States can, can bring. And last but not least, but also the most important of all the four of them, is this uh, morass of public debt. Uh, 
now and in the future because the age-related burden of public expenditure in terms of health care isn't going to get any lighter. Um, according to, if you actually had to pay for all your health care bills on current, actually I don't know post the reform actually what it looks like, but before the bill was passed, if you looked at all the commitments made by the federal and state governments to health care programs on the basis of population projections which look fairly stable out to 2050, you have to pay for it today. The, the accumulated cost would be something like 500% of GDP, right? It would have to cost you five times your GDP to pay for all of that. Obviously, that's unpayable um, over a, even over a long period of time. So my view, I suppose, is that failure to rise to these challenges might have very dark consequences uh, for all of us, actually, in the years ahead. Um, and the most pressing one, of course, um, as the President opined in the State of the Union address, uh, apart from the fiscal problem, is um, enhancing infrastructure, education, innovation. This is all kind of yeah, yeah, so what? You know, we knew that, but actually somebody actually has to make it happen. But you have to articulate it and start the process. Uh, but actually avoiding the public debt morass is, uh, is obviously a very big priority. Um, my own view about this is you don't have to be chased today. Uh, it's not essential uh, to basically squeeze uh, the budget as my, uh, the government in my country is doing. Um, not always for the best reasons. Some of them are blatantly political and probably unnecessary. Um, but it is important to have a plan to regain control over public finance and to convince creditors that you're serious about it. I mean, the bold Simpson proposal, a series of proposals, seems to me in the outside to be a very plausible set of, uh, of, of ways in which to go about this, this process. Um, and what I worry about as a global citizen now, rather than as a Brit or anything like that, is that if you are forced into a dramatic uh, austerity program because of inertia in Washington, and if the markets basically bring about uh, a forced situation that causes the United States to disengage more from uh, the global system, um, where it alone actually, in my view, is suitable and fitted to provide that kind of global function, then I think that really would be uh, a very unfortunate uh, turn of circumstances. So. From abroad, uh, across the pond, you know, I'm kind of not speaking for the world's uh, citizens, but actually we hope um, that the, the agreement that there is, everybody agrees what the goal should be about uh, public finance, um, but it's absolutely essential, as I'm sure you know uh, as well or better than I do, um, that some sort of bipartisan agreement be reached at an early, early possible uh, moment. Uh, so on that happy note, um, thank you very much for listening.